and welcome to this talk for Etapai. Uh, today we're here with Linus Bullman. Uh, he is a graphic designer and uh, communication uh, designer based in London. He's also well known for making YouTube videos where he explains typography to non-type designers to make it more approachable. Today, um, he was working for 10 years as a branding, desi as a branding designer, where he decided to step, take a step back and focus on his project, Calligraphic. Uh, today, he's here to talk about his, uh, the history of type in comedy. And we hope that you enjoy this talk. And afterwards, we'll have a little Q&A with him. So please drop all your questions in the chat below. Thank you very much and enjoy this talk. Hi, thank you for joining. My name is Linus and I want to start by asking you to flex your imagination and picture in your mind the style of typography that says neutral and professional. Got it? Chances are you thought of something like Frutiger or perhaps another humanist sans serif. Okay, imagine the typography of haute couture, premium and luxury. Chances are you thought comic sans, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, Dido or Bodoni. But really, what kind of type connotes humour? And no, I will not feature any type by Vincent Conner in this talk. <laughs> Comedy has always been seen as a low form of art for the masses, and as such it hasn't received much cultural analysis. Today I want to dive deep into the visual culture of comedy, focusing on the typography of comedy club brands. As a graphic and type designer and former stand-up comedian myself, I've spent quite a lot of time musing on the subject, and not only whilst contemplating some monstrosity of a logo from the comedian's green room, though that may have been the genesis of this project. The very fact that this conference is taking place virtually speaks to the challenge that live entertainment venues of all stripes are facing in 2020. Sadly, a number of formative comedy venues have had to permanently close their doors this year, and the live comedy industry is grappling with an existential struggle. So it feels like a fitting moment to reflect, collect, and celebrate this aspect of comedy's visual history. For the sake of brevity, my focus is going to be mostly on the birthplace of stand-up, the United States, and we'll look at clubs from three distinct periods, the pioneers, the boom of the 1980s, and the 2000s alternative comedy boom. I can't hope to be comprehensive in this talk, but we will talk about some landmark venues and their influence and influences, as well as looking at the present and projecting forward to round things out. To set the scene, stand-up emerged as a new form of comedy distinct from that seen in vaudeville and other variety entertainments around the 1950s, but there were no dedicated comedy clubs until the 1960s. So if you wanted to see stand-up, you went into a nightclub or coffee shop, venues where you'd see a mix of music, poetry, and comedy. The Gaslight Cafe in Manhattan was a notable venue, and if you've watched the first series of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, the character there performs at this real-life historic venue. Here in the Village Voice, amongst these venues, is where we see advertised the first ever venue which will later become a true comedy club. Bud Friedman's Improvisation Cafe. Originally, the logo is set in this fantastically 60s type, Caruso Roxy. Of course, the flower power aesthetic isn't influential in comedy, save for some of George Carlin's hippie phase, perhaps. And eventually, the improv logo is changed to what we know today. This was revised around the time their second location was opened in Los Angeles in 1975, and this type Piccadilly had only just been released in 1973 by Letraset. It's very in the 70s zeitgeist, an art deco headline style reimagined as rendered by neon tubes. The improv has become the largest comedy chain in the US and they retain this now 45 year old logo, which is impressive. Art Deco inspired typography saw a huge revival in the 70s and 80s particularly. Especially this style, Broadway, which was the basis for Piccadilly and other decorative variants. It was very popular across the entertainment industry, note the extreme stroke contrast. There was a taste for pushing proportions and scale in fashion as well at the time with huge collars and platforms, shoes, so why not also in typography? Speaking of Broadway, here we see it again, this time for Catch a Rising Star. 
This was New York's other hugely influential club, helping launch the careers of Robin Williams, Chris Rock, Jerry Seinfeld, and many others. Now, the type for this branding changed a few times over the years, but eventually settled back on Broadway. But another element of this 70s typography is this rainbow arch. In fact, the arch and stars became so iconic during the peak of Catch's influence that other regional clubs would imitate their branding. But this didn't happen within a vacuum. Disco was huge in the 70s, and nightclubs, discos, and other nightlife venues loved this typographic convention. It was everywhere, and this really makes sense. The comedy club, as its own genre of entertainment venue, hadn't yet matured. If you said, let's go to the comedy club to somebody, they might not understand, and in fact, many early clubs called themselves comedy nightclubs for clarity in those days. So it made sense to look towards other nightlife venues for inspiration. Now, here are some venues which have, knowingly or not, followed in these footsteps. The boarding house here being an exception. They were a primarily music venue, which became a very important uh, club in the San Francisco comedy scene around a similar time. But the Comedy Store in London, the UK's first comedy club, which opened much later, was clearly influenced. Uh, they wholesale just took the name and concept from the Comedy Store in Hollywood, so... Why not steal the look from New York? And speaking of duplicates, we have the Georgia punchline here, not to be confused with the punchline in San Francisco. Speaking of which, for contrast, here we have one of San Fran's early comedy institutions, the Holy City Zoo, with a look that's very California. It's more Art Nouveau than Deco, with a delightfully Victorian type uh, it's called Milton, similar in character to Windsor, but with that high crossbar on the H and those angled counters on the capital O's. This aesthetic didn't really spread beyond San Francisco, though it does seem to fit the countercultural look of the era and the place. One exception being Cobb's Comedy Club, also in San Francisco, with its hand-lettered, nouveau-inspired logo. Uh, though the word order is a little difficult to scan, it is delightfully quirky. Also, on the West Coast, down in Los Angeles, the Comedy Store becomes the hub of stand-up in Hollywood for a generation. Now, the typography is distinctly evocative of the circus, though the Comedy Store never really settles on one canonical typeface. The facade and advertising and interior signage all use conflicting type styles alongside hand-rendered variants. But this ornate Tuscan-style lettering does evoke the circus, which is quite a different idea than evoking a nightclub or disco. The circus certainly had a kind of comedy, though clowning was very different to uh, stand-up. It did immediately bring a sense of fun and family entertainment, and therefore it's a little bit less sophisticated than the East Coast examples. Now, as a typographic trope, this style was by far less influential, and that might have to do with the technology of the time. While the deco typefaces of New York were very much of the photo typesetting era, this circus style type was a throwback to the era of wooden type. The 19th century wood type styles like this were intended to be printed at huge sizes, but in the 1970s and 80s, comedy clubs would be advertised in small print ads in the newspaper, or use small flyers and handbills. So a lot of the ornament of these styles gets lost and muddied by the print technology of the time. So very few are inspired to imitate the store. You occasionally see this style for poster and album artwork, perhaps more during the digital type era than before, but it's still a relative rarity. By the mid-1970s, there were a handful of successful clubs around the US, but cable television alongside other new technologies poured fuel on the fire, and by the mid-1980s, comedy clubs started proliferating at a breakneck pace to try to keep up with demand. There was serious money to be made. Catch a Rising Star Incorporated raised $3.5 million in its initial public offering in 1987 and massively expanded its franchise. This became the era of corporate comedy, and with that establishment, we began to see tropes and conventions become entrenched. In this section, we'll look more at these tropes than at specific typefaces, and not all the examples will be from the 1980s comedy boom, but it was the boom that entrenched these cliches into the visual language. Another pioneering New York club was the comic strip Live. It was certainly a frontrunner in terms of this style, which became hugely popular in the boom era. 
Where the comedy store leaned on the circus for visual associations with comedy, the comic strip leaned on its namesake, particularly the daily or weekly comic strips from newspaper publishing. Now, stand-up comedy has about as much in common with cartooning as baseball has with golf. Yes, they both have something in common, a joke or a ball, but the skills and tools of the trade are completely different. But for some reason, this comic book lettering became a visual shorthand that was adopted by many clubs. This cartoony style hand lettering was extremely popular. An outlier here is the Pittsburgh Comedy Club, whose logo is set in brush script, but the Cheshire Cat mascot would sometimes appear in print ads breaking the fourth wall and talking directly to the reader with a cartoon speech balloon. Fun. Also, Canada's biggest comedy franchise, Yuck Yucks, started with this very cartoony balloon lettering and now features a logo very reminiscent of one particular newspaper strip with the letters slightly askew in that signature cartoon style. Which brings us to Zanies, also now a chain, but this logo was introduced somewhere around 1986, making it one of the earliest examples of this typographic convention. Without invoking comic book lettering, the Zanies logo takes the same rhythm of type, the alternating randomly skewed lettering. The cartoon figures alongside the slogan make that inference that the letters are rolling around with laughter. It's like typographic onomatopoeia or visual slapstick. And just like slapstick, success is all about execution. Barrel of Laughs at Sinise's restaurant, also near Chicago, predates Zany's by over a year and has a suspiciously similar logo. But here we can see the breadth and depth that this convention has taken on over the years. We have some where only a single letter is off kilter, like Just For Laughs and The Stress Factory, some modulating scale and proportion, like The Laughing Skull Lounge and The Boston Comedy Festival. We also have the oddly isometric design for Hiccups and the strangely slip and slide arrangement of PJ's Comedy Alley. This is only a small sample of brands playing with this idea, and there are many other variants, including uh, the modulation of the baseline, letters uh, remaining upright but jumping up and down. From the clumsy to the subtle, this is definitely the most successful meme in design to convey comedy typographically. Before we move on, I just want to show some oddballs from my research of this era. Uh, Dangerfields is more of a pioneering club, but that lettering is so odd. And it seems like they lifted the lettering from the cover of his comedy cookbook which was apparently a thing. Um, I also really have a soft spot for this logo type for giggles. Uh, what a unique take on having the laughing mouth trope uh, than expressing it through type. That's just good fun. Following the comedy boom, there was a bust. Uh, the market became saturated and as a result, many comedy clubs folded. Comedy clubs continued, but for a growing number of audiences and comedians, mainstream comedy had become hack. This is the era of airplay and food jokes and lazy observations on gender and race. And eventually there was a reaction against this. Speaking of hack, this didn't really fit into any particular time period, but it felt wrong to leave out a word about skeuomorphic type. In particular, lettering made to look like neon lights or marquee letters started with light bulbs. This practice predates the rise of desktop publishing and Photoshop, but those things certainly made it worse. Not too many major comedy clubs lean on it for their main branding, but it certainly became a cliche of amateur shows, flyer templates, etc. And I think I hate it so much because it cannot be any more literal. It speaks to an utter lack of imagination. And even with the budget of a major production company and the BBC, it still looks awful. So let's all agree to stop doing this. Finally, we catch up to the present day. After the low point of the 90s, a new generation of comics took a different approach to the now established comedy industry and self-produced shows which took place in alternative venues to the mainstream clubs. This was the birth of alternative comedy, at least in the American context. In some ways, it was going back to the earliest roots of stand-up in variety venues like nightclubs and coffee houses. Eventually, the style and aesthetic of alternative comedy became mainstream, and the most popular comedians with Netflix specials would be considered alt-comics. Let's take a look at how this was reflected visually. 
A huge trend in the last 20 years has been the rise of a new long-form improv and its cross-pollination with the stand-up world. Improv schools and theatres had their own visual language, a lot of it inspired by activism and propaganda, which used visual cues like grunge textures and skewed typography, unlike the one we'd seen before, where each letter is skewed, but rather where each line is askew, as if placed by a street artist working at speed. This was also a time where alternative spaces became preferred venues for certain styles of stand-up. These venues had very little shared visual language with the mainstream comedy clubs, and that was a bonus. Audiences were prepared to see something that didn't resemble the style of comedy in comedy clubs. Beyond the venues themselves, promotional materials for comedy changed drastically. The sketch show Mr. Show with David Cross and Bob Odenkirk leaned into surrealist animation and underground comic creators like Daniel Klaus and R. Crumb. Comedians like Patton Oswalt and Brian Posehn were huge comic book nerds and they commissioned illustrators who created posters for indie bands, which began creating original art for these alternative comedians, infusing them with references to nerd culture, as well as drawing from influences of earlier counterculture. This meant there was also a lot more hand-drawn lettering during this period, which became another signature element of the alternative comedy style. One influential comedy showcase from the last decade was The Meltdown with Jonah and Kamail. For this weekly show, illustrator Dave Clock made a new limited edition poster every week. You can see the eclectic influences on his style, and there is a vast range of hand lettering and typographic treatments. The brand here is held together simply by the artist's shared visual sensibility. These influences can be seen in print and in online promotional materials for alternative comedy shows across the country and around the world. There is a shared visual lexicon that is rooted in a DIY aesthetic. During the 2020 pandemic, there was a strong push toward uh, live streaming shows, but the consensus has been that it cannot replicate the experience of live in-person comedy. The medium is still young though, and as it matures, comedians will find ways to exploit its strengths and avoid or downplay its relative weaknesses. But so far, we haven't seen any new trends emerge in the visual arena. I want to end with a quick look at a personal project. Back in 2010, I started a comedy night in London with another comedian, Barry Ferns, called Angel Comedy. My involvement has been minimal since 2012, and possibly because of that, this club has grown to be one of the leading independent clubs in the UK, and the only one run by comedians. I slapped together a quick logo for a flyer back in 2010, and since then have occasionally gone back to overhaul the look and feel for the club, and this year I decided to take another stab at it. Typographically speaking, something I've not seen in my research has been deliberate juxtaposition. This is the visual analogy I've chosen for the club. Comedy is all about unexpected juxtaposition. I've chosen two beautiful, variable font families that are complementary but contrast, both open source, and I highly recommend you check them out. For the club, my second inspiration has been street art and stickers, particularly layering of visual elements. The contrasting type styles here work as another layer in this visual style, which can be broken down into a kit of parts and recombined in different combinations. Where the prime medium of promotion in the old days was newsprint, now we have social media and my design has grown out of the touch point of Instagram as the key stress test of the system. So I hope this overview has been of interest to you. I feel this has been a bit of a whirlwind tour. In summary, the visual evolution of type in comedy mirrors that of a successful comedian's career. At the beginning, you cannot help but wear your influences on your sleeve. And then when you find success, you develop a voice of your own, your own style. And thirdly, once you become established, you must evolve past your own cliches to keep things fresh and perhaps even dig deeper into your early roots. We're currently at a turning point for comedy, and a lot of things that I discovered for this talk may not be accessible in another 10 years. A lot has already disappeared. What makes live comedy special is its ephemerality. It can be recorded, but it's nothing like being there. Once the moment is over, it's gone forever. Unfortunately, much of comedy's visual history is also made up of ephemera, flyers, posters, and things which were never intended for posterity. Many have already been lost, but there's still a chance to capture this while it's still in living memory.
Having said that, thank you to Rich Scheidner for sharing sources from his touring days during the 80s comedy boom. And if you wish to learn more about comedy history, I highly recommend the History of Stand-Up podcast. Please feel free to reach out to me via my website. I also make videos about design on YouTube for a mass audience where I'll be posting a companion piece about the symbol and icon cliches of comedy as well. Thank you again for your time and I hope to hear from you in the Q&A. Hi. <laughs> I think that cut off a little bit um, early. But um, yeah. did it? The yeah, video it did cut out a little bit early. Oh. Um, that's, that's okay. I thought it was over. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for this talk. Uh, it was a huge uh, compilation of things. I was not expecting to see so many different variants. And um, I would expect that from one, um, how do you say it? From a starting point, it would develop in a more uh, straight line kind of exploring mm -hmm. different visual environments but i would have never expected and i would have never seen so many different ups and downs in the visual history of comedy yeah it's something that um not a lot of people have <clears throat> explored um uh thanks cena for that comment um and uh it's it's kind of seen as kind of a, a big established industry today um, but it really kind of um, was something that people had to slowly be introduced to and because of that um, what surprised me I think was how much it uh, kind of borrowed from uh, disco and other kind of nightlife um, uh, visual associations at the beginning and how some of that's still kind of um, relevant today how the improv is actually still the biggest comedy chain of the US and you can see that kind of uh, deco revival influence still there. Um, yeah. But it wasn't until I kind of went back and zoomed and looked at the big picture that I understood where that came from. So um, I don't know about the UK. Oh, wait. But I have the sun shine. Sorry. Okay. This is not getting better. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, do you think um, in the UK specifically where you're based, uh, mm -hmm. all of those visual codes were inherited from uh, USA because it was where uh, startup comedy kind of uh, started? Or do you think the UK started to develop its own code in a different path as well? That's a good question. Um, comedy, what, what actually got cut off a little bit um, at the end was uh, if people are interested in learning about the history of, of stand-up there is a podcast called the history of stand-up that they can check out um that kind of gives a bit more because i could only skim the top um but that one particularly deals with the development of stand-up as its own art in the us but the uk has had um uh it, it really is woven two different strands so the american uh, influence is is uh, only partial because the UK had its own kind of um, talking comedy uh, that was in working men's clubs and uh, music hall, which was a British equivalent to kind of vaudeville uh, that had its own tradition. Uh, but then I think the Americans kind of influenced them during the 80s and also kind of vice versa. Monty Python was a huge influence on comedy in the States. So uh, it's been a kind of cross pollination. But um, yeah, I think a lot of the tropes kind of were borrowed wholesale. Uh, on the visual side from the Americans. I'm just seeing some of the um, the comments in here. Why do I dislike the light bulb ones? Uh, I think that uh, it's, uh, I have another video on my our channel kind of looking at icons and semiotics uh, of, of comedy branding. And it's, um, I really dislike um, the, the smiley face icon as well. Um, I think that when you go very literal, it's a little bit lazy and uninventive. <laughs> Uh, and so I, particularly, I think that's something that the UK are guilty of is um, because a lot of their comedy venues were theatres, um, that they would have these kind of stage, uh, stage lights and marquee lights. And uh, they would just use that stage prop as shorthand for, for the comedy show itself. So I think it's, it's more the laziness uh, is one count against it. The other side is that it's very hard to execute well. Uh, you know, it often looks like cheesy, you know, glow filters in Photoshop 
that's not much fun. Um, Ishan has a question. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, it would be interesting to know who designed these graphics. Uh, from what I can tell, they seem to be done by untrained designers for the most of the part. Uh, there's, there's a vernacular prestige that obviously shows through. Would be interesting to see more on Icon X. Yeah, I would. Uh, it's it's something that's very um, difficult to research because it is something that hasn't had much um, academic uh, rigor in. In fact, the the guys who make the uh, history of stand up podcast, uh, one of them is a uh, a pro professor in comedy studies, which is only something that happened in the last um, three four years, perhaps. Um, and there is now also an American comedy institute. I can't remember the exact name of, of what it's called. Uh, and they have some archives, but there hasn't been any kind of research into who produced these uh, graphics. I do suspect quite a lot of them, particularly the smaller early uh, shows before the, the kind of boom were produced by amateurs. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there's not really that many examples of outstanding kind of um, technical finesse in, especially in that era, but it is it's probably because of that uh, am amateurishness that there's such a, uh, a breadth of interesting examples um, uh, and particularly very quirky ones. I think I did highlight um, the Giggles uh, logo where the kind of the um, the first story counter of the G has been turned into a smile. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I quite like, quite like that one. And I don't, don't know if uh, I can't tell if that was someone very amateurish, um, but uh, you know, with an artistic bent, who did that, or was it uh, a designer who did that? Because it's it's impossible to know where these came from. A little bit. So there is no actual um, author that that we can say, okay, this was this person who was in charge of uh, these designs, therefore um, we can research his career and we can research his own uh, visual uh, code uh, development, right? I think the only way to find out would be to try to hunt uh, down the surviving owners of some of these clubs, because a lot of them now are closed or changed ownership. or um, And that's kind of um, an oral history that, that nobody's kind of really looked into. Um, because yeah, I found like little quirks like this, um, like um, the Barrel of Laughs uh, club that was very, very amateurish, uh, but actually predated Zanies, which has now become a huge chain, uh, have very similar both typographic treatment and also they have these kind of laughing little figures kind of um, drawings. And it, because they were both so close to each other, it may have been that one artist was commissioned to do the first one and then the guy just hired the same guy, or was it kind of a, 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 a taking it without without asking permission, just kind of borrowing it, um, uh, ripping off the style, which is very strange. But the only way to find out would be to interview the people who were there at the time, and it, it's hard to know uh, how to contact all of these people. So uh, one resource that I used in this uh, talk was uh, a comedian called Rich Scheidner wrote a uh, a memoir of the 80s comedy boom, um, his experience as a performer, and it's called Kicking Through the Ashes. And I reached out to him and he shared some um, newspaper clippings and, and uh, flyers from his own personal collection. Um, but uh, yeah, you can find, you can Google him and find more of his stuff. But it is, it would have to be on the ground kind of research to try and track down the origins of some of these. Mm -hmm. And did you when you when you did, decided to join the the comedy yourself uh when you had to design your own brand um did you decide to focus on some kind of inspiration from a spe in, from a specific period or did you start by thinking okay i'm gonna design something completely fresh and i'm gonna create my own code um well because so the comedy night that i started was 10 years ago and I've kind of done done maybe four major revisions of the the, the logo that I did for that club. Uh, and this year, kind of with the downtime that we've had, uh, I thought it was an interesting time to revisit it. But I think, um, you know, this kind of falls into the, the larger trend that we have of, uh, I think people are a little bit 
uh, tired of the austere minimalism of clean sans serif type. Um, I think kind of we've had a good run of that kind of minimalist look and, and it's not maybe the best choice for every institution. And kind of that's what I was, I was using um, Fabricat as the, the brand typeface before this, um, which uh, it's a perfectly good typeface, but I think something with a bit more quirky character um, and actually thinking about a, a type system where kind of pair different uh, contrasting typefaces uh, would be interesting. And also I'm very interested in the, uh, I've used two variable typefaces that are open licensed. Um, I'm very interested in the animation potential for, with variable typefaces. I think that could also be a way of visually representing the unexpected by having kind of type uh, move and morph uh, in animation, but uh, didn't get a chance to explore that in this, this, this talk because of time. Yeah, that was going to be my next question, since you have picked actually viral fonts. Uh, how could those, because right now, I think it's kind of like in the question, the question that is on the table, how we are producing and we're designing variable fonts and how can we implement and how can we use it now? Uh, so I think it could be very interesting to have like a pioneer part in comedy, <laughs> actually. Yeah, I think it's a good case uh, usage, a good usage case for this kind of variable font thing because, um, uh, you know, I think that that metaphor of contrasts and juxtapositions is something that I I, uh, I feel resonates with comedy, um, and uh, yeah, seeing kind of it's about you know the setup and punchline structure of jokes is you kind of set up expectation for one thing and then you subvert it, and I think that uh, having variable fonts that it appears you know it can be very, uh, you know, soft and rounded and, and uh, ultra bold. And then suddenly you have, you know, very angular, clean uh, and ultra light version of the same thing. I think yeah. there's, there's something in that parallel. Yeah. Ishan said that he believes that the example of Jiggles would be something that a trained designer would typically do, stretch and tag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's almost like one of those things of, um, you know, you need to know the, you need to know the rules before you break the rules kind of thing um, where like, is it someone who's really make gone out on a limb and having fun because they, they know they're breaking the rules or is it someone who has no idea what the rules are and it just happens to be kind of charming in the way that it's, uh, yeah. it's done. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, do you think in the future, well, I think, since you were explaining that the industry right now it's much more the spirit and every kind of club kind of develops its own style in the comedy itself, do you think that that will influence also the typographic uh, picks that they take to to approach them? Well, I think that it, one thing that kind of uh, came through was that uh, the type technology of each era kind of did have an influence. Um, I think that that kind of the photo um, typesetting era was very influential in the kind of selection of fonts that people used at the beginning. And then as kind of um, more uh, standardized digital fonts came onto the market, especially when people weren't necessarily trained designers making these things, there was a much more kind of uh, vernacular use of, you know, like the Bitstream 500 CD or something like that kind of, uh, selection and now when there are a lot of comedy nights are started by um by kind of comedians independently uh and i think clubs as an institution uh having a dedicated business around running one venue um it definitely has to adapt especially if um if public uh, performance is kind of restricted in the long term with what we've seen this year um, so I think there'll be a lot more kind of uh, small shows. And um, I think with the increasing uh, public kind of design literacy that we have and the kind of golden age we have now of, of new, uh, especially free to use type um, uh, or, or kind of um, open source type, I think that we will see more inventive use, hopefully, of, of type and not just kind of the um, following what's been done before. I think that's very positive from a sector since we are seeing in other sectors that it's actually happening the opposite. It's like becoming unstandardized and 
some styles are becoming the standard and everybody just falls in place, like James Edmondson put it in, in a tweet a year ago or something like that. Um, I think it's very interesting that it's such a different field and it's developing in its own way and nobody's just dictating anything and it's very freely. I think for many graphic designers, um, new graphic designers, especially like young ones, mm. would be very interesting to as a field to explore, I think. Yeah, I think it's a very, well, we, it's kind of that um, thing that we're having a crisis in graphic design at the moment of, um, you know, the bottom end being eaten up by marketplaces like 99designs and, and various kind of other places. A lot of the opportunities that were there for me, you know, um, 15 years ago coming out of university as a fresh graphic designer aren't the same opportunities that are for new graduates now. Mm. And um, you really do have to kind of um, uh, DIY, make your own kind of personal projects to, sh to flex your uh, design skills. And I think that kind of meshes really well with the DIY sensibility of, of particularly indie comedy. You know, if, uh, if I were uh, someone who had just recently graduated from a design degree and was interested in type, I would probably be reaching out to uh, Facebook groups or, or small comedy shows that I see online in my area and kind of offering, hey, I could, you know, partner with you, just get some free tickets to the show or something like that. <laughs> if they'll probably be as broke as, as uh, the comedians will be as broke as the designers. Um, but it is uh, an interesting space because also um, it, we've had kind of a settled, there's been a settled kind of visual la language uh, in indie comedy over the last 12 years or so, which has been influenced from indie band graphics and hand-drawn stuff. But um, I think as we kind of move to more stuff being virtual and in social media, that might not be the most um, repeatable and, uh, and visually clear style to approach. Like that, that show that I talked about, The Meltdown, they had a poster artist who made a, a new limited edition poster every week. But um, I think there could be something much more interesting uh, in terms of our digital uh, promotion of, of events like that. You know, that's taking a completely native digital approach to to graphics and, and type. I think it will be very interesting to see how the field develops. And I think it was a great um, explanation throughout the timeline. Uh, does anyone else have any more questions that we would like to answer? If not, I think we can move this uh, talk into a more uh, casual space, and that would be in that room where uh, we can talk more about uh, comedy and type, which is a very interesting conversation, I think. And uh, thank you very much for your talk, Linus, and thank you very much for uh, your YouTube channel. I think it's helping the word to spread uh, the knowledge on typography, and I think it's very interesting to reach out to people who do not have access to it and give them a chance to learn about it. So thank you for that. And thank you. Uh, thank you. For your talk. I, I actually could I get get a chance to quickly plug <laughs> plug that channel if yes, you yes of course because uh, I don't think that slide was shown. It was uh, my YouTube oh. channel was just my name uh, YouTube dot com slash Linus Bowman, and I think. Um, there's, a, there's an, a different conversation we can't get into because we're just wrapping things up, but I think there's a, a case to be made that uh, uh, popular science and science communication has been very successful in reaching out to the general public, uh, of doing public outreach to people who are non-scientists and explaining the value of science to them. And I feel like design as a whole has done a very poor job of reaching beyond its own borders. Mm -hmm. Um, so my channel is very nerdy and appeals to a particular kind of viewer, but it is aimed at the non-designer. Um, and I, I hope to see more of that kind of stuff happening on YouTube, um, people trying to reach the general public and explaining why design is interesting and valuable. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. And we will see you all in the Hangar room. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.